Welcome everyone to today's Cultivating Success Small Farms webinar. Today we're excited to be talking about beneficial insect habitat on your farm. Cultivating Success is a 20-year-old program and it's a partnership of University of Idaho Extension, the nonprofit Small Farm Organization Rural Roots, and the Washington State University Food Systems Program. Today's presenter is Ariel Agenbrod. She's located in southern Idaho in Ada County, the Boise area, and serves the southern region, a five county area in food systems and small farms. I'm Colette De Phelps, and I'll be your facilitator today. I'm located in Moscow on the Moscow campus. A couple webinar tips. If you're having any trouble with the speed or the sound of the webinar, you could try closing all of the other programs that are running on your computer, particularly those ones that are requiring some of your internet bandwidth. You could also call in on the phone. The call in number is provided in your welcome email. At any time during the presentation, you are welcome to type in questions for Ariel into the Q&A box, which you will find at the bottom of your screen in the control bar. You could also type in uh, questions or comments regarding technology and assistance. I did email handouts to everyone this morning that included a copy of today's slides and two handouts that Ariel provided. There will be a recording of this webinar and those handouts will be posted on the Cultivating Success website. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and let Ariel share hers and jump into the presentation. Wonderful, welcome everybody. I really appreciate you all joining us here today to talk about this topic. I'll get the slides going right here. All right, I hope that everyone can see that. Yes, we can see it just fine. All right, again, so this is assessing pollinator and beneficial insect habitat on your farm. And thank you for that nice introduction. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about why do we want to save pollinators and beneficial insects? What is their value to us, to the environment, to our livelihoods as small farmers? How do we assess our farm or property for available habitat and then the practices that support these creatures on our farms? And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about how to find funding and other resources that can help support the development or maintenance of pollinator habitat or improvements on your land. And I realize there's a typo there, but I will have to change it later. All right, so again, we know the pollinators are important because they're, they're so vital to the production of many of the foods that we enjoy and they are really vital to our diet. So fruits, vegetables, nuts, um, seeds, all of these plants require insect pollination. While there are some crops that we rely on that, that do uh, require wind pollination, a really, really large proportion of crops that we eat are pollinated by insects. Even foods that you might think are not typically assigned or associated with pollinators, like ice cream, are still entirely dependent on them. When you think about what dairy cattle in our country eat, they eat primarily of alfalfa. And that, again, is an insect pollinated crop. So to have alfalfa seed, we must have insects. Uh, to have ice cream, we must have dairy. Uh, and even if you're eating non-dairy ice cream, you know, a lot of these things that go into it are going to be insect pollinated. Uh, and then again, financial. There is a really significant financial impact that pollinating insects have on the agriculture in our country and worldwide. So if we look at just the value of pollinated crops in the United States, uh, crops pollinated by honeybees alone, so this is, these are imported uh, cultivated honeybees, it's about $18 billion per year. And half of this production is in the Pacific Northwest and California. So the Northwest is very, very key to producing these crops uh, and they contribute very, um, very significantly to our economy. And then if we were to look at the crops that are pollinated by native bees, uh, these are crops that are valued over $3 billion or more. And if we look at just our region here in the Pacific Northwest, we have over 1600 species of native bee that is, uh, that is native to this area. 
Um, I don't know all of them, so don't ask me that question, but we will talk a little bit about um, how to support them all. So one of the first steps in, uh, in protecting our pollinators is to get to know them a little bit better and know who we're trying to attract, uh, what their needs are in terms of habitat, food, shelter, et cetera, and how to provide that for them. So we're talking about the social bees. So again, this is the honeybee, uh, the bees that live in, in communities, whether they're managed or free living. But we also have a significant number of solitary bees and many of our native bees fall into this category. These are bees that, that live, that mate, that rear their young primarily in solitary. They don't have these community groups. We're also talking about wasps. Many of our wasps are beneficial for a number of reasons, uh, both as pollinators or predators. And then there are a lot of uh, pollinating beetles, flies, and of course the butterflies and moths. I think we often don't um, assign pollinator duties to beetles and flies and wasps in the same way that we do to bees, butterflies, and moths, but they are very significant and very important. And this little critter that we have pictured here, while at first glance, if you're not really looking closely, you might think that it's a bee. It's black and yellow striped. It you know, matches that kind of um, uh, description. But if you look more closely, you notice that it has only one pair of wings. Uh, it has a really pronounced um, eyes. This is actually a fly, a serpent fly or a flower fly. And again, they can be important predators, but also very important pollinators. So we're talking about beneficial insects. We're also talking about our predators and our parasitoids. So these are the insects that target insects that we would consider as pests. Some of them are a little more indiscriminate. They target really all other insects. Uh, but often we see their benefits in predation outweighing uh, any risk. So we're talking about the wasps, um, quite a few flies, beetles, um, assassin bugs and other true bugs, the mantids like pictured here, and then the spiders and mites who aren't really insects at all, they're arachnids, but they also play an important role in predation and in serving as natural enemies of pest insects that we encounter. So, and again, we could spend many, many webinars just learning about these creatures, learning about their habits um, and, and more about them. But really the purpose of today's webinar is to talk about how do we assess the habitat for these guys on our farms. And to guide us through the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna to refer to two different publications. And these were both sent out to you if you registered for this webinar. If you did not register for this webinar and you're viewing this later on in the future as a recording, uh, we will provide links to where you can download these publications from the Xerces Society. So these are, this is Beneficial Insect Habitat Assessment Form and Guide and then the Idaho Pollinator Habitat Assessment Form and Guide. So we are the only state that has our own, and that's because of a significant research project that was conducted in Idaho a few years ago with the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides, University of Idaho Extension, uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Xerces Society. And both of these publications are available on their website for download, and, um, and I will also link to them too. And then here's just a link where you can get these assessment guides. There are a few others as well. So if you are not yet living or working on a small farm, maybe you just have um, um, an urban or rural property, there is a guide for yards, gardens, and parks. And then if you are working more with a natural area or rangeland, there's also a habitat guide for that. But we're particularly going to be working through the publications that are for uh, on-farm evaluation and a lot of other resources available to you on these websites. I wanted to just mention really quickly, uh, we, as you start going through this guide, you're probably gonna have more questions. You're gonna be curious about where do I get more information about some of the things we're talking about, whether it's developing habitat or planting beneficial plantings or attracting certain species, and also what plants work for my climate and environment. So I'm gonna give you a few resources right off the bat um, that you can refer back to. And so one of these is the Xerces Society website. That's X-E-R-C-E-S dot O-R-G. Um, the Xerces Society is devoted to invertebrate conservation and their website is just a treasure trove of information, of resources, of uh, interactive tools for 
um, assessing pollinators, learning about pollinators and predators, um, joining citizen science projects, et cetera. So I really love this website and I encourage people to spend a little bit of time here looking through. And, and again, this is where you will get those publications. Uh, and I would really recommend if you have not already to maybe have that open in another window or to have it in front of you um, as we go through it, if you'd like. If you haven't had time or you don't have a printer where you are, that's fine. I'm gonna show a lot of the images on my screen too. Um, and again, so this is just another page on the Xerces Society about um, understanding and evaluating the habitat that you currently have. And so it's really going to be a step-by-step -step process of looking at all the different areas where habitat could be and how that could be provided. And then really ranking your uh, personal property and coming up with an action plan for improving or strengthening what you already have. All right, so um, again, these two publications are very similar, whether you're looking at the beneficial insect or the pollinator one, we're gonna start with just the pollinator one for now. So again, this is a tool that is meant to help educate uh, conservation planners and land landowners and help you to prioritize some of your conservation ac actions, uh, whether it's identifying areas for improvement or strengthening or bolstering of other areas that you have. And so again, this is gonna be a subjective process. You know, you're, you're only gonna be able to go through it with your set of eyes. Um, this is a really great uh, thing to do in groups. So if you have maybe other farmers or other growers who are interested in doing this, to do it together really helps um, increase what is being seen and the interpretation of that. When we did this process on several farms in Southwest Idaho, we went as a team. We went with the farmer, um, we went with um, representatives from the different agencies that were involved and we all went through the form together and gave our feedback and it was really interesting because everyone sees something a little bit differently. So if um, you go through it and then you have a fellow farmer go through it, you're not always going to see the same thing. So it's going through, um, and this works in both orchard and field crop settings. Um, it would also work on grazing operations or livestock operations if you have, um, if you have additional areas where you can have habitat. So um, it involves um, looking through this, taking notes if you want, you can take photographs to put into your report. Um, and it might be really beneficial prior to doing this to have an aerial photograph of your property. And this is so easy to do now with Google Earth or with the NRCS Web Soil Survey uh, or other ways to get those satellite images of your farm. Some growers even have drones and could take their own photographs. So we, as we go through the assessment, we're gonna go through the five different sections. Um, section one is looking at your landscape features. Section two is your farmscape features. Section three is foraging habitat. Section four is native bee nesting habitat. And section five is your farm management practices that may have an impact on beneficial and pollinator insects. So you go through each of these sections and you come up with a score for each of these sections. Then you subtotal these scores, put them all together. Um, and you're going to be looking for a score of at least 100, if you could. Um, and so if that's not possible for you, then you've got some work to do, and we're going to help you where you would find that information to make those improvements. All right, and so this is just a, um, a shot of the site summary, right? So you would put in, if you don't have a, you know, a field office that you're working with, if you don't have a planner you're working with yet, that's fine. Just fill this out as much as you can. Again, this is for your benefit primarily. Um, and if you do decide to start to try to apply for some funding, then, then at that point you might want to share this with someone else. But for right now, it's just a great exercise in assessing your, your property. And you can see there's where the, um, those sections that I mentioned just a minute ago, those five sections, and you would come up with a score. And you can do this before and after. You can do this now. And you could do this again at the end of the season after you've made the uh, improvements. And this is a great time to be doing this because you have all season to plant, to, um, you know, to make adjustments on your farm. All right. So number one, we start with the landscape features. And again, this is where having an aerial photograph of your property is really helpful 
so that you can see everything at once. Um, you can do this on the ground as yeah. well, um, but especially if you have changes in topography on your property, um, or you know, if not everything is visible at one time, this can be a great way to go. And so what you're doing is you're looking at the characteristics of your broader <laughs> landscape and identifying which ones have a significant influence on wild bee populations and the pollination services on adjacent sites. So you're kind of looking for these natural areas in the landscape um, that are going to increase the likelihood that you will have habitat for bees and other insects. And native plants especially are really critical for supporting overall pollinator and wildlife diversity. And so you're not just looking directly at your property, but you're also looking at what is directly adjacent to your property. Uh, and if it's just other fields, that's fine too, but taking the, all that into consideration. And so some of the, um, so what you're looking at really in this one is what is some of the dominant vegetation in the non-cropped areas within a half mile of your farm? Do you have native plants? Do you have a mix of native and naturalized plants? And again, they don't necessarily have to be native plants, but they have to be plants that have naturalized somewhat and that are non-invasive. Do you have naturalized flowering species? So this would be, these could be things like clover or alfalfa that have maybe escaped the farm and established on their own. Um, they could also be, you know, perennial crops. We'll get into that in a little bit though. Um, also, do you have a mix of native naturalized and um, even weedy invasive species? So what are, the, what, what are the invasive species on your property? Oftentimes invasive species are not as beneficial in terms of food and habitat to pollinators. Uh, and then do you have um, invasive flowering weeds on your property? So these would all be things that would go into the total score uh, for, your, for your landscape features. And again, what you're looking for too is what, and then what it is shown in these images here it's what is the percent of natural or semi-natural vegetation within a half mile of the farm. And this can include prairie, shrublands, woodlands, grasslands, riparian habitat, even wetlands. It does not, however, include uh, lawn grass, invasive or weedy vegetation, or overgrazed um, pasture where flowers might be scarce. So you can see in this picture, um, the one on the far left has uh, greater than 20% Per, um, percent of natural or semi-natural vegetation within a half mile of the farm. The next picture has about 10 to 20 percent. The next one has about 1 to 10 percent. And then this last picture of these very heavily cropped regions showing zero percent of natural or semi-natural vegetation within a half mile of the farm. So this is going to be very different depending on where in the region you farm, what is around and uh, maybe even the types of farming that you are engaged with. And just to show some examples um, from some of our site visits. So this was a, uh, um, this is a, uh, a vineyard in uh, southwestern Idaho. And you can see there are some areas of natural vegetation further out. Uh, this is kind of a sagebrush step area um, near the Owyhees. This is, um, you can see that native vegetation. You can also see some naturalized um, plantings of trees. Those could look like poplars. While they're not necessarily native or, or nat they have been naturalized and it's a pretty big stand of them. You can also see some lawn grass areas. Again, that would not be counted into that total and neither would um, the, the planted vineyard um, because that is a cultivated crop. We come to that later, but right now we're just looking at the naturalized areas. Uh, and you can see off further in the distance, there is some more of the native vegetation. All right, and this is another example from another farm. So again, you have kind of a, a naturalized hedgerow of um, potentially some native, but also some uh, naturalized species. You can see further on, again, this is Southwestern Idaho. So our native vegetation looks different than it might in other parts of the state where it might be more mountainous, it might be more forested, uh, it might be prairie. Um, but this is what we typically have here in our area. You can also see that along these crop, crops, there are some plantings of naturalized vegetation of flowering grasses and other plants. So again, you would look at this and take into account the whole, the whole percentage of what is a non-crop area on your farm or within a half mile of your farm. 
And then here's one more example. Again, we do have some naturalized plantings of trees and shrubs. There is um, considerable native vegetation, although you might be not seeing a lot of vegetation. Uh, there is diversity in those plantings if you were to be closer and see what was going on in those foothills. But just again, to give you an idea of what the non-crop versus the crop vegetation might look like. And again, it'll be different for your farm, especially in different parts of the state and region. All right, so we've kind of looked at the overall landscape features. Uh, now we get a little bit closer into talking about the non-crop forbs and flowering shrubs. All right, so again, these are some more of your, um, your farmscape features. And so you're looking for things like permanent meadows, field borders, perennial insectary strips. So these can be things that you have specifically planned and planted and that are part of your farm. Uh, but again, these are non-crop areas, right? So we're looking for really, what we're looking for here is nectar. We're looking for flowering plants. So this could also include pasture that has um, maybe 30% or more non-invasive flowering plants. So if you have a mix of clovers, alfalfas, et cetera, in your pastures that are allowed to bloom, then these go into that calculation. Um, if you have any woodlands, hedgerows, or bushy areas adjacent to cropped areas, that are composed of diverse, primarily native trees and shrubs that flower. Again, this would go into your, your percentage calculation. Maybe you have windbreaks um, that are composed of coniferous trees or shrubs. Um, they might not be pollinator attractive, but they might reduce pesticide drift from adjacent cropping areas. So that's something else to think about is, is the value of those woody tree or shrub plantings aside from just the nectar that they might provide. And then are there any riparian buffers or filter strips that include uh, flowering plants? And then do you have any annual flowering cover crops that are allowed to bloom? Um, do you plant a specific bee pasture, an insectary strip, or do you allow crops to bolt? So this would be again, if you maybe you had a cropping area, but you weren't harvesting it, or a portion of this crop was left to flower. And again, you can see these pictures greater than 85%, uh, 45 to 80%, 20 to 30 or less than 20 percent for that last photo. Right. Uh, and here's a, a great photo of an insectary planting. Again, this one is um, right now you're only seeing really one primary species in the zinnia. Ideally, you would have a mix of a lot of different kinds and types of flowering plants. Um, but again, this would be going into your proportion or your percentage of flowering plants in this in this farmscape. All right, and you do want to have that diversity of different types of plants that are attractive to different kinds of insects. And so where the zinnias in the slide previous, these can often be very attractive to butterflies um, in that they are they're wide flowers they are typically reds and oranges. Uh, your bees are going to prefer um, these tubular flowers or elongated flowers in purple like this, um, like this hyssop or mint. Right. And then too, when we're looking at this, when we're looking at the habitat, um, whether it's the non-crop area or other areas of foraging habitat, um, then we're also looking at landscaped areas in some cases. Uh, and especially on a small farm, you don't want to discount the impact that even your landscaping may have if it's providing a significant number of flowering forbs and non-crop plants. So this is a landscape. Uh, these are flowering sedums, which uh, are really unique in that they bloom into the fall. And so they may be providing nectar and food sources when many other things have stopped blooming. So do take those into account, especially if you have um, significant landscaping around your farm. And this is, I think, particularly true in very small farm environments that we really want to count everything that is flowering. All right. And then two, we want to look a little bit at, you know, if we are looking at our cropping systems, are there times when our crop is producing and providing significant food for our pollinators? And in this case, this apricot tree um, this was part of a vineyard. Uh, the, the primary crop were table grapes, but he had several of these um, ap ap apricot trees on the farm. And when they were in full bloom, they were a significant source of food for, uh, for the beneficial insects. 
So be looking at that too, if maybe it's not your primary crop or maybe it's a crop that you are also sharing with the pollinators. All of these things are going to be counted as to your, um, your total food sources for these insects. All right, so next we're gonna look a little bit, um, we looked at maybe where, where insects could go for food. Now we're going to look a little bit at where some of our native pollinators in particular could go for habitat, for where they would, they would live and raise their young. And if we're looking at um, ground nesting bees, we're looking at some areas of undeveloped, um, undeveloped ground. Now, typically, you know, we often say, oh, bare ground, you know, is just open to weeds and erosion. Uh, but a little bit of bare ground on your property can actually be really important for these ground nesting bees. And so this would either be areas that are uh, typically undisturbed by tillage. Um, maybe they do not have um, significant crop cover. Again, you're gonna have to weigh this with the other risks that you might have for having uncovered ground. You know, if it's very possible that noxious weeds are gonna come into that area, you probably want to take some sort of action if you live in an area where soil erosion is a very real and pressing issue, again, you want to limit the amount of bare ground you have. Uh, but if it is possible and if it is not going to be disruptive or detrimental to your farm in another way, do think about where you might have some space for these ground nesting bees. And you can see this one on the far Right, that is actually some different native bee nests. They do nest in the ground and there are a lot of ground nesting wasps as well in our native pollinator um, makeup. All right, so the other thing you might do is thinking about how to, um, how to artificially provide some habitat for some of these bees. Um, again, if you have a lot of woody plants on your farm and they are hollow or pithy stemmed woody plants, even things like raspberries and things like that, that can provide significant habitat and nesting site, but you may have to artificially provide some of this. And again, I would really refer to um, some of the research-based sites for how to do this because there are very specific requirements in terms of the diameter, the location, uh, the protection that some of these things need um, to be hospitable to some of these um, solitary bees that want to lay their eggs in tubes like this PVC. And we can help connect you with some of those resources. And a lot of this would be available through Xerces on their website too. All right, so the last thing I wanna talk about um, in terms of as you're going through this and scoring your, your habitat is thinking about the farm management practices and what you do in and around your habitat areas that might have significant influence on bees and other um, native insects and beneficials. So I'm going to talk about some more of those, but first I really want to focus in on pesticide use because this is probably the uh, one of the most immediately impactful things that we do on our farm. So I just wanted to mention when bee poisoning is more likely to occur. And this is when insecticides are used during times when bees are actively foraging, uh, during times when bee pollinated crops are in bloom, and then thus the bees are foraging. Uh, when you are applying pesticides to blooming weeds that are adjacent to bee pollinated crops. So remember the bees are not going to only pollinate your crops. They are going to take advantage of any potential food sources in that environment. And so if you know if you're, you're thinking, well the bees are only on my crop, they're probably not. They're probably everywhere. And then also if, you're, if pesticides are being applied in a manner which then might allow them to drift onto blooming crops or blooming non-crop areas. So these are, these are the times when it is most critical that we pay attention to um, how and when we're applying insecticides and what kinds are being applied. And again, you may not apply any pesticides, but if your neighbors are, or if your, your weed departments are, if there's other users applying these pesticides, these are times when everyone needs to be really aware. So another time um, that we need to be especially careful is when, um, when bees are collecting pollen. So if they're uh, collecting pollen from insecticide contaminated plants um, that may not need a pollinator but are still a food source or a pollen source, 
we run the risk of damaging or impacting these insects. And so an example would be corn, which is wind pollinated, but it still produces pollen and that pollen may still be collected as a food source by pollinators. And then they're inadvertently collecting insecticide contaminated pollen. And again, too, um, depending on when and how trees or shrubs are treated with systemic insecticides, um, bees may be able to collect pollen that is going to be contaminated and affect them when they return back to their nesting sites with it. So these are just things to be really aware of. Uh, and then this is a list of the chemicals that are responsible for um, most of the bee poisoning events that have happened in the Pacific Northwest. So these are the organophosphates, um, the N-methyl carbamates, the neonicotinoids, and the pyrethroids. So uh, insecticides that fall into any of these chemical groups are primarily um, the most dangerous because most of them are non-selective. They are non-selective contact insecticides, meaning that they don't, um, they don't discern who they are killing in the insect world. They may be targeted at a pest, but they are going to be effective at, uh, at killing any insect that comes in contact with them. And so these are the chemicals that it is especially important to um, be aware of how they're being used, in what manner, on what crops, and in what way. And you might think, well, I would be safe if I'm using organic insecticides, right? They're, they're kinder and gentler. Well, the problem is that these, some of these organic insecticides are still um, non-selective, meaning that they, they can target any insect, whether you intend them to or not. And these are the permethrins. So these are the naturally occurring version of the pyrethroids that we mentioned in the previous slide. Also spinosad. So this is a biological. Um, it's really been turned to as an alternative to the organophosphates and the carbamates, uh, but it is non-selective and it, um, it is very deadly to many different species of insects. So it needs to be used very carefully. Um, and again, going back to the spinosad, uh, one of the benefits I think of some of these organic insecticides is they often have a, um, uh, a lower residual rate in, or that they are less active um, over time than some of the uh, non-organic, but they are certainly capable of killing insects when they are active. Uh, diatomaceous earth is another one, very commonly used by home gardeners, organic growers, um, especially for crawling insects. But again, the, it is non-selective. Non um, any insect that is crawling over this or coming in contact with this has the potential to be affected by it. And diatomaceous earth works by um, destroying the exoskeleton of the animal or the insect. Um, it's not really a, a contact poison, it's more a physical action. All right, so when we look at our farm management practices, we definitely want to think about our pesticide use first, whether it's organic, whether it is synthetic, and um, also what's happening around us by our neighbors or, um, you know, or others that might be applying pesticides near to our, our habitat. So some of the other farm management practices that we want to evaluate when we're going through this form and we're trying to score our habitat is we are looking at our pest management practices, our pesticide use, but also our land management practices such as um, our high crop diversity, right? And how much diversity of plants do we have on our farm? Um, are, we, are we encouraging growing conditions that optimize plant health, uh, limit plant stress, and improve, improve pest resistance? So often healthy plants are going to be less attractive to pest insects. Um, are we growing resistant crops and varieties that are um, automatically going to be less resistant to pests and disease? Because often, you know, a, a plant in distress literally calls out to some of the pest insects to come in and, you know, and mobilize and help that plant to, um, uh, to be removed from the environment. So a healthy plant, healthy, diverse environment is really important. Uh, are we using crop rotations to break pest and disease cycles and improve plant health? Um, are we really thinking about our planting times and are we altering them to reduce overlap between major pests and sensitive stages of plants? So this may not always be possible, especially if you're growing for market and you've got a different timeline, but it's something to think about. Uh, and then are you practicing sanitation? 
uh, on your farm? Are you removing or destroying infected fruit or plants um, and, and keeping things clean? And then how are you supporting beneficial insects? Are you using cover cropping, intercropping? Um, are you tolerating low levels of pests so that you're not, um, you're not spraying, um, you know, when, when you see any kind of problem, but rather you're waiting and taking action when your pest uh, problems meet, meet a certain threshold. And again, that would just be good integrated pest management practices. So the other thing we're looking at too is, you know, those that areas of naturalized habitat, no matter what kind of production system you have going on, that diversity of flowering plants in your rangeland or your pasture or even in your landscape. And then do you have some areas of undisturbed flowering plants, either in your row crops or your orchards, um, around your livestock, um, you know, just any kind of this undisturbed border of flowering plants is gonna be really important. Somewhere where it's not mowed, it's not weeded, it's not cultivated, and it's not sprayed. And so this is just showing, we're gonna show some different, just some different views and you can look at this and think about how you might evaluate this. Um, we do have some crop diversity in this photograph. Um, not a whole lot of flowering plants though if you look at the um, at the mown areas, it looks like there could be some, you know, some potentially flowering plants in there, maybe some clovers or some other low growing things. But I don't see a lot of flowering plants right now in this, even though there is a diversity of plant material. I would say the one major benefit is that there is crop rotation going on. And I would say that the, uh, the naturalized tree and shrub border could potentially be beneficial but there, again, there's not a lot of flowering going on either in the crops themselves or in the adjacent uh, area. And there certainly really aren't few areas of undisturbed except for that tree planting. And I'll let you look and think if you can see some other things too. And uh, just, well, I've got on this picture, I will share some other things from, uh, from the guide. So other things you might be looking for, right? Um, looking for, um, if you are mowing, you're mowing to reduce bloom in any, you know, are you reducing the bloom by mowing? And in this big picture, it looks like that could be happening. Um, and then again, do you have a buffer between applications of pesticide and habitat areas? Again, I'm not sure whether this farm was organic or not. Um, you know, if they were to be applying pesticides, there, there isn't a whole lot of room for buffer here. Um, since most of this is cropping area. All right, and so here's again, here's a livestock operation. Again, just to show that habitat can be present in, uh, in non-crop areas, even in farms that are specifically or primarily growing livestock. So you have these grazing goats, uh, you have quite a lot of vegetation inside and outside that pasture, uh, depending on how the rotations are there may be plenty of time for these flowering plants to bloom uh, and to be a food source for pollinators before they're grazed. There's also some naturalized and native vegetation adjacent to the farm. You can see behind the barns and behind the, the buildings where there are um, trees, shrubs, and potentially other flowering plants. Again, not a whole lot of diversity that you can see in these pictures. So this would be something uh, that might score a little bit lower as you're doing the walk around this property. But just to show that, especially in a rotational grazing situation, there are opportunities to increase the habitat. Right, and again, this is another farm. This is again in Southwest Idaho. And you can see that there are some areas of undisturbed border with these, um, these bunch grasses and there's some flowering forbs and even some flowering weeds in here, but they are not considered to be um, noxious or invasive, so they are allowed to flower. And again, there are some undisturbed areas of ground that could potentially be host to the ground nesting bees. And then in this farm as well, they do have significant native vegetation beyond their farm borders, but again, thinking about the, the flowering schedule of those non-crop areas, they, they might actually have to augment that and plant more flowering plants on this farm. And though you can't see from this photo, there are significant pollinator strips and planting areas that were incorporated into this property. But even this little um, planting of these grasses 
at the end of the rows um, was creating that undisturbed border and um, repository for beneficials. Uh, and here's another photo. This is a young orchard, uh, a new planting of orchard trees. And you can see there's quite a bit of plant diversity going on here, just even in the ground cover. Uh, I do see some clovers and some other things, though potentially mowing them less would create more food sources. There's also um, quite a significant undisturbed border behind the trees with a bunch of different naturalized grasses, trees, shrubs, and other flowering plants. So again, um, probably more diversity than you would think in terms of looking at it right away, though the mown area, um, you know, that could be for different reasons why they mowed, but maybe mowing a little bit higher or delaying mowing until those plants have flowered and had uh, the benefit of feeding the insect populations. Right. Um, and so again, uh, thinking about how you're using insecticides, um, how you're mowing, uh, how you're rotating your plants, um, really thinking about can any of these management practices be adapted to consider the nesting and foraging needs of native bees and other beneficial insects. And uh, the reference materials that go along with these guides really offer a lot of suggestions on how to improve this. And then if, you, if your farm does include a significant amount of rangeland or pasture, um, you know, are you using grazing practices that might encourage wildflower diversity um, or abundance of different flowering plants? Or are you doing short duration grazing with long recovery periods? And if your farm has orchards, vineyards, or row crops, um, are there some ways that you can avoid disturbance in certain field borders, um, maybe by infrequently or only when you need to coming in and cultivating, mowing, or spraying? All right, so you go through all of this, you come back to, to your, your score sheet, and you enter in your overall score. And again, we'd be doing the before and then hoping that we would take the season to make any necessary adjustments. And then to do this walk around or this assessment, again, you could do this um, at, the, at the end of the season. You could do this at the same time next year and see how you have uh, made improvements on, on some of these practices. So I was gonna talk a little bit about how do you get some assistance for doing this and where you might find funding to make some of these improvements or get some advice on how to make some of these improvements on your farm. Uh, and so like I said, NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, worked with the Xerces Society and the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides and University of Idaho Extension in creating these materials. And they really do want to support with through technical assistance, through cost share and other programs, um, the establishment and support of conservation plantings. So if you have not already um, you know, met your NRCS advisors or been to their offices or talked to someone, this would be a good time to go. And you could take this, your assessment form with you and say, you know, this is where I identified some of the needs that I have, some of my shortcomings, where I would like to improve habitat on my farm. What are some of the programs that you have that might help me to do this? And so they might look at irrigation, they might look at um, cover crop or pasture, they might look at um, plantings of native and adapted species, doing hedgerows, doing um, you know, border plantings, et cetera. And in many cases, they can provide this technical assistance to you, and they may even be able to um, provide you with cost share or reimbursement for doing some of these things. And the sooner you can talk to them, the better, because it's often a, a several month process of applying and getting connected with the right person and then going through the application and paperwork. So it's not something you'll be able to walk in the office and leave that day you know, with, with the money in hand or the seat in hand, but um, they can certainly really, they can give you that advice right away. And I would also recommend reaching out to your local extension office um, to find out if there's anyone uh, near you or in your region that has this kind of expertise that can help you with this as well. And again, uh, NRCS can provide technical assistance, conservation assistance, um, and actual financial assistance as well. 
Uh, and then uh, for, you know, for small farmers, even for homeowners and just really concerned citizens, NRCS does have quite a few resources on their website for, um, for farmers all the way down to urban city dwellers that want to do their part to support habitat and pollinators and beneficial insects. So this is just uh, one of the sites on their website. It's got a lot of really wonderful information both about how farmers can help pollinators, how gardeners can help pollinators, uh, and then how the NRCS can help you to do this work as well. All right, and actually I went a little bit faster than I thought, so we do have plenty of time for questions. Um, I just did want to remind you that these, this assessment guide was downloaded from the Xerces Society at xerces.org, and on their website to supplement these, they have a number of um, publications on pollinator conservation, habitat installation and assessment, um, plant lists for the different regions. Uh, we can also, through extension, help you a lot with identifying beneficial insects. We have a number of publications on our website um, about how to, how to create habitat, how to identify these insects, um, and also for native plant lists in particular, uh, we've done a lot of work with um, what, what kinds of species are adapted for mass planting or um, restoration. So I encourage you to reach out to Extension, reach out to NRCS. If you live in the southwest part of the state, the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides has an office here. Um, they're a great resource. Uh, we can all do our part to protect and preserve pollinators and beneficial insects on our farms. Great. Thank you, Ariel. That was a great presentation. We do have one question that has come in so far, and the request is, can you talk about herbicides, not pesticides, and if they are toxic to bees landing on such non-flowering plants? Oh, that's a great question, and that's going to be really on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, most herbicides um, are going, well, all, every, every pesticide, whether it's an herbicide, an insecticide, et cetera, is going to have information on their label on the environmental impact of that product. So the label would be the first place that I would go. Um, I would say most of our herbicides are probably going to be less dangerous to pollinators um, if they're used in the prescribed manner uh, and if the insects are landing on the, the treated plant material um, once it's dry. Uh, however, um, obviously herbicides are going to have an impact if we are spraying flowering plants and we are removing that food source. But as far as the, the individual and direct threat to the insect you know, from that product, we would have to go product by product and look at that label. I would say the greater damage is uh, when we are maybe combining products, you know, if there's like tank mixes going on, or if um, we're just, we're taking away food sources that that insect population was relying on or had been, um, been particularly using at that time. But that's a great question and one that I would like to look into a little bit more. Again, looking at the label of um, those different product, products and seeing what the recommendation is for those. Okay, great, thank you. At this point in time, we don't have any other questions that came in. I want to thank you for your presentation. And if you stop sharing your screen, I will share mine and show for folks where they can find some resources on our website. So here you see the Cultivating Success website. And I just want to let you all know that we are updating our programs regularly. Here's where you can click to find this recorded webinar and the different resources Ariel talked about. We will also make sure to put on the front of our webpage a link to the University of Idaho Extension publication site where you can browse the different type of publications that we have that might interest you and be helpful as you're looking at the habitat on your farm. We have two more webinars that that are coming up in this winter's webinar series. So tomorrow we have part three of financial fitness for farmers looking at enterprise budgets. Parts one and two are recorded and available in our recorded webinar section on the Cultivating Success website. Next week we'll have part four that is looking at cash flow statements. Each one of these webinars 
just flows into each other. You can watch them separately. However, we are really encouraging people to watch the entire series. Again, you can re register for all of our, our webinars from this link, cultivatingsuccess.org webinars-series. And that link is in your handout. We would really appreciate your feedback about this webinar. If you would take a moment when this webinar closes to do our quick survey, that would be wonderful. That survey is going to launch immediately in your browser, so it will be very easy to take. With that, we hope that you have a happy and safe afternoon. And if you need any assistance from us, please let us know. We're here to help. Thank you and have a great day.